and welcome to The Game Changers. I'm Sue Anstis, and this is the podcast where you'll hear from trailblazing women in sport, exploring their stories as we consider wider issues around equality in sport and beyond. I'd like to start with a really big thank you to our partners, Sport England, who support The Game Changers podcast with a National Lottery Award. My guest today is Hannah Mills, the most successful female sailor in Olympic history. Hannah won a silver medal for Team GB alongside Saskia Clark at London 2012 before the pair went on to win gold in Rio 2016. Hannah retained her Olympic title with her new partner, Ailey McIntyre, at the Tokyo Games in 2021 and was also the Team GB flag bearer for those games. Off the water, Hannah's hugely passionate about the environment. She's an International Olympic Committee Sustainability Ambassador who launched the Big Plastic Pledge in 2019 and co-founded Athletes of the World, an athlete group campaigning for positive impact around climate change. In 2021, Hannah joined Sir Ben Ainsley's Sail GP team as its first female sailor as part of CellGP's Women's Pathway programme. And in 2022, she returned to the water just a few months after the arrival of baby Sienna. Hannah was awarded an MBE in 2017 and an OBE in 2022 for her services to sailing and the environment. So Hannah, you've clearly had the most extraordinary sailing career and there's so much I'd love to explore with you. But can I start by asking you about your first experience in a boat? When when was that? Yeah, well, my first experience sailing was when I was seven years old on a family holiday down in Cornwall. My two older brothers had been on a sailing course and I was just desperate to have a go. I just wanted to do everything they did. And you had to be eight. And so I got to have a quick go for an hour while they let me come out and I just absolutely loved it. So the following year when I was eight and we were back back down on holiday, I got to have a proper go for the whole week and fell in love with the sport and um, begged mum and dad to let me carry on when we went back to Cardiff where I grew up. And were there elements that you felt when you were on the boat at that time that kind of stayed with you for all of sailing? Do you still feel those elements today? Yeah, 100% actually. It's such a unique sport in many ways, I think especially for a kid, you're out on the ocean, um, which is just so vast. And that sense of freedom and being in control of, of a boat for any child, I think, is just the most magical thing. And it just gives you such a sense of responsibility and confidence, I guess, that you can you can do something like that. And um, and it's still still the same in, in a different way. It's, yeah, it's so freeing being out on the water. Yeah, bigger boats now. Bigger boats, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and in terms of that pathway then into competing, did you know from an early age that you did want to compete or was it just something that you were doing for, for the joy and the fun of sailing? I mean, initially for sure, it was just the joy and the fun, but I was unbelievably competitive at everything, probably horrifically so for mum and dad. And yeah, it was only a matter of time probably until I realised you could race boats. And then for me, that was just it. I was absolutely hooked at the possibility of of racing other people and trying to beat them around a course on the water. Yeah, it was was amazing. Did your brothers go on to sail competitively? No, well, my oldest brother didn't get past that first week, actually. (laughs) He (laughs) um, he, he had a bit of an issue where he got stuck under the sail when the boat capsized, um, which is where it flips over. And so he just hated Mm. it. But he wasn't really into sports that much anyway. And then my middle brother... He he loved sailing, but he's not really competitive. And he now um, he now coaches sailing actually at, at the local sailing club in Cardiff. It's still in the family there. Yeah. And what was the process like? You talk about that competitive side. So, what was the process like then to qualify in terms of Team GB and that Olympic pathway for people? Yeah. Well, my family weren't really sailors at all, so we didn't have any idea about well the fact that sailing was even in the Olympics or the pathway. But it was really clearly mapped out, to be honest, which made it really easy to kind of follow, I guess, for, for people that didn't know, which, which was us. So, you know, I, I got into initially the Welsh squad, sort of under 16 in the Optimist class, which is a single-handed boat, you sail on your own. And then through that, got selected for kind of some of the British squads all the way through youth sailing in, in the different boats you can sail. And 
And I knew in the back of my head, if I got a top three result at a world championships in that youth period, I could make the jump to the, the Olympic development squad at the time, which is kind of the pathway, I guess, to going to the Olympics. So that was always the goal for me was to get that top three, which which I managed to do. And so jumped onto that development squad. And then it's just purely erasing the boats that you'd race at the Olympics. And so it's very much like a trajectory of your, you know, your results in, in international competitions to to see if you're ever going to get to the place you want to get to. Friends Daughters, part of the GB windsurfing setup, and I'm always amazed to see how global the sport is. I see her posts of where she is around the world, and I guess that's the same for sailing and windsurfing. That so much overseas travel, so it must have been a, a challenge for the family. But I'm thinking of kind of that, a commitment that the family needs to make to support you in a sport like sailing. Yeah, it was it was a, a good commitment from everyone, which was which you know I was so fortunate that that mum and dad were able to do that for me and and yeah support me in in that journey. But definitely with the sport, it doesn't have to be that commitment. You obviously probably to go to the Olympics, you probably would need to do a lot of that. But there's so much now around the grassroots and just getting people out on the water and enjoying the sport locally in the UK. I mean, we've got endless coastline and and possibilities and then even inland you know I learned I really learned to sail on a on a reservoir in Cardiff so so yeah there is a lot of work being done to to try and make it yeah just UK based and more accessible as well and obviously it's over a decade ago now but what a place to start that Olympic career so London 2012 what are your memories now when you think back to that home games I know lots has happened since then but but as you can reflect on that what what are your kind of core memories of going into those games yeah, I mean, London was just everything for any athlete that had a shot at going to the Olympics. Like to get to like, go to a home games was just, you can dre- have dreamt it growing up, really. So, yeah, just to get there was, was a huge battle. In sailing, there's only one spot per class. So there's 10 Olympic sailing classes. And yeah, just, just one country spot for each one. So just to get there was a huge battle. And I always felt like if you could get there as part of the British sailing team, if you could get to the games, you're going to be with a shout of getting a medal because we had such good depth and inability. Um, so you kind of had to be in the top three or five in the world just to just to qualify for the games. So we did manage to qualify, uh, which gave us a huge confidence boost. I was in a two-handed boat at this point, 470 sailing with Saskia Clark. Saskia had been to the Beijing Olympics, so she'd got that Olympic experience. So that was a huge boost as well. And I remember like we just like everything about the London Games was just like embrace, embrace the whole circus that is the Games because it is just unbelievable. There's so much stuff going on. You know, you're part of Team GB, which is just like the most phenomenal thing. You really feel like you're in this family of of other athletes and, and they make it feel incredibly special. And yeah, we just embraced everything that was Olympic. And I think put that into our performance, really. We didn't shy away from what we were there to do. And I think for me as a first time games goer, that was that worked really, really well. And yeah, we had the most amazing, amazing time. Except for the fact we got a silver medal, which <laughs> granted is obviously great. But um yeah, we we yeah, we went we went there to win for sure. Yeah. It was at the time and even now it feels really a bit frustrating and disappointing. It's weird, isn't it? I remember that image of you in tears being comforted by Saskia at the end of the race. And it, it makes me think it's so tough, isn't it? That actually, you, as you said, you win a silver medal at the Olymp- at home Olympic Games. And yet there's a sense of disappointment. So how, at the time, how did you cope with that? Because you're a young, you know, young athlete coming into the Games too. Yeah, I think I always think this with Olympic, the Olympics. It's always about how you, how you win the medal. And for us in that moment, it felt like we'd lost the gold rather than won the silver. And so, you know, you, in the moment, you're there with all these thoughts of like, should have, would have, could have, in hindsight, should have done this, should have thought about that. And you just don't know if you'll ever get a shot again as being that close to winning an Olympic gold medal. Um, you don't know what's coming in the future. You know, as I said, just to qualify for the Games as part of the UK British sailing team is, is incredibly hard. So, and I thought Saskia might retire as well because she'd already done two Olympics. So there was lots of just emotion and you're in front of your friends and family. It's a home games. You'll never get that chance again. So yeah, lots going through your head in that moment. It took a long time to kind of, I guess, process it and bounce back and think, do I want to put my signal through all of that again without any sort of guarantee of an outcome at all? 
Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? I spoke to Holly Bradshaw on the podcast about that kind of post-Olympic blues period too, both for those that win gold and those that win any medals and those that don't win medals, but almost how that impacts the athlete. And I think sometimes as a spectator or a fan of a sport, we just watch it for the few hours that we do or the few weeks it's on and then we move on with our lives and you uh, you know, almost don't comprehend the impact that it has on, on people's lives and well-being throughout their careers too. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a really funny thing. I could, uh, don't get me wrong, it's the most unbelievably amazing thing to to train and compete and try and get to an Olympics and then ultimately try and perform at an Olympics is incredible but um, like with anything that's you know incredibly challenging and takes almost everything out of you to be able to do it it comes with highs and lows and you know after the Olympics win or lose there is this void of you know you've been working sort of your whole life but definitely four years towards something that lasts a day a week or whatever and then it's gone and all that support's gone in a moment and um it's very isolating and lonely straight afterwards it's a very strange feeling definitely it's sort of swept out from under your feet almost and it's done and dusted and yeah it, it's um i think people experience it in everyday life with different things you know a wedding you know anything that's a big feature can be weird afterwards because it's suddenly done and gone and it's like, okay, and everyone else has moved on with their lives and you're kind of still like, yeah, but but what? That's only just happened. <laughs> yeah, it's good. I think it's important that, we're, that at least we're talking about it. I feel like we're, we're discussing it more now and that's a, a key part, I guess, for other athletes who are in that process now hearing that too. But you did go on, as you say, to compete in Rio in 2016 and you know what an experience that must have been then to finally be on the podium and hear yeah. the national anthem. So and how was that experience for you in terms of uh, the gold after the silver? Yeah, it was just unreal. I think the first Olympics is almost easier in a way because there's, you know, you have your own expectation and obviously people have expectations of you, but there's nothing to kind of judge you against because you've never done it before. So yeah, it, the second games definitely felt more, you know, we've got a lot to lose here and nothing but gold is good enough really because we've won a silver medal. And so, you know, putting your ego on the line, putting everything on the line, it's really, really hard. Um, thing to do but we had we had the most extraordinary journey actually in the build-up to to Rio as as a sailing team you spend a lot of time in the Olympic venue because you have to get to learn the water the tides you know the wind bends everything that goes with it so we spent probably 180 days in total in the two years building up to Rio training there and yeah it was an unbelievable place with with many ups and downs for us we we got mugged actually in in 2014 and that kind of took a bit of time for us to to build confidence again in, in just being in the venue. And I was like, God, we're going to have to perform in this place that I'm just struggling to kind of feel comfortable in. So some of those kinds of challenges um, were di- very different to London. But as a Games, it was it was a lot less olympic I would say, in, in how it felt. You know, you felt very conscious that there was this big kind of divide of, of rich and poor in the city and, and you know, just felt uncomfortable that, we were there competing at the Olympics, but there was also, you know, a lot of poverty around. And so it was a bit of a funny one, but obviously as an athlete, you kind of have to try and put all that out of your mind and just focus on doing the job at hand. And the week was a bit of a blur, to be honest. It always is. It goes so fast, but to come out at the end, I remember just that feeling of we like, we finished the final race and we knew we'd won gold. I just like, just like so much stress and relief just felt like it poured out of me in that one moment. Um, and my mum was out there uh, to, to watch, which was just the most amazing thing to to come in and, and see her straight away. Um, just, yeah, relief is probably my biggest takeaway from that feeling. So more tears, but tears of a, of a different kind. Yeah, totally. <laughs> And then on to Tokyo, and obviously it's a strange Olympics for many people in terms of the delay for COVID, and, and you had a new partner then with a McIntyre too. So what had driven you on to compete in another Games? Because it's almost like you look at your career, not that you should retire after gold, but you'd almost reached the very top of the sport. So what was it that um, encouraged you to, to go forward, or did you automatically feel you would go on to another Games after Rio? No, definitely not. I mean, Sass, Sass retired after Rio. Uh, which was obviously a big deal. We'd had such an amazing partnership. And so I thought probably I would 
retire. But in that Rio cycle, I'd become really aware of, of the plastic pollution crisis, actually. You know, it was becoming more and more obvious everywhere we sailed, and particularly in Rio due to the topography and, and other factors. You know, there was so much plastic waste um, in the waters we were sailing in. And I, I it definitely ignited something within me at that point. I was like, oh my God, like we have to do, I have to try and do something about this. And after a while, I sort of came to the conclusion that actually, if I carry on trying to win an Olympic gold medal, this gives me quite a good platform to to, to try and raise awareness and to try and um, ignite change when it comes to plastic consumption, particularly single-use plastic. And it felt like something I had quite a lot of control of in my own life that I could make a change. And so actually maybe I can inspire other people to do the same. So it kind of the two came hand in hand. You know, I felt like I had more to give in the Olympic arena. I was excited by the challenge of sailing with someone new and trying to build a new partnership. But then I was also excited by the possibility of trying to make a difference um, environmentally as well. And so that was, I guess, the main driving force. And how different is it with a new, completely new partner? Because I guess you must have known Saskia so well, having, you know, had that two cycles with her too. As a, as a kind of a lay person that hasn't been in that tight partnership in a boat with somebody, but uh, how important is that to absolutely get that right? Yeah, it, it's everything. Um, it's so intense a sailing partnership. You know, you're literally like a married couple in many respects. You live in each other's pockets day in, day out, you know, each other inside and out because you have to have the most honest conversations imaginable to to try and get the best from each other and to understand each other when things aren't going so well. So yeah, it's it's a real privilege and a real challenge um to to do that with somebody. So um yeah, the thought of of doing it again with with Ailey was motivating and exciting, but also really daunting. And I was also really conscious that AD wasn't SAS. And so we couldn't just copy and paste what had worked for SAS and I, because that was not going to work for Ailey and I, because, you know, I was a different person in myself and she was definitely a different person to SAS. So yeah, just so much learning, so much learning. And how did it feel then? Obviously another gold and then to become the most fe- successful female sailor in Olympic history. When you think back to that little girl at seven going out on the water, uh, but kind of what are your reflections from that? And, and then uh, again, also having that profile then for, for the message for kind of driving change in terms of um, kind of social impact. Yeah. It's so bizarre when you, because each Olympic cycle is so individual, like it, it, it always takes something very different to win each Olympic Games in particularly in sailing because of the venue you know the venue is always different so the wind's always different and so the, some of the skills you have you need might be different so they always seem very individual and the challenge so when you put it all together at the end and you've won two golds and a silver and you have this title of the most successful female Olympic so yeah it's, it's kind of crazy um, and definitely not something I set out to do but was yeah obviously very cool. I definitely added a little bit extra pressure for the Tokyo Games, knowing that, that was a possibility. But at that point, there's so much pressure anyway. <laughs> it's sort of all just bundled into one big pressure cooker of, of trying to perform under that huge weight of expectation. But yeah, like g- genuinely for that Tokyo, Tokyo Olympics, for me, it was when it was really, really hard and things weren't going well or, you know, I was, I was struggling with whatever challenge we were facing, it would always come back to the fact that if we won, I would have a bigger platform to talk about these other things that I really, really cared about. And that that for me was so much motivation to to really push through. And was there ever a consideration that you might have continued on to the next games or were you, were you done then? I was done in many respects. It's very hard to stop the Olympic Games because it is honestly amazing, but it is also, it takes absolutely everything from you, you know, especially to, to stand on the podium. It's, yeah, it's all consuming what you have to give to it, which, yeah, it's, as you get older, can can get harder with other things in life that you maybe want to do and, and think about. So, yeah, I was always pretty confident I was done and I definitely started planning my next steps of career around sort of sustainability and sport and how I'd manoeuvre in, into that. Um, but then at the same time, this unique, incredible opportunity came along in, in the way of Sail GP, which is, or at the time was quite a new global sailing league that was kind of taking sailing by storm. And 
it was all dominated by by men sailing these fifty foot boiling catamarans that go like a hundred kilometers an hour top speed. Like they're just ridiculously amazing boats. And I was just watching on in awe of, of these boats and thinking, oh my God, that looks absolutely amazing. And then just before Tokyo, they launched a women's pathway program to try and get females into into the into the league. And I just jumped at the chance and um, tried out on the British team, got the call up to Ben Aisley messaged me just before, the day before I started racing in Tokyo to say, you've got the spot if you want it. And I was like, oh my God, this is... <laughs> Crazy timing, but okay, I'll get back to you <laughs> after this is done. So yeah, so that that came became an option, and for me, Sail GP was the ultimate kind of career move because it meant I carry on my athletic sailing career in a totally different environment in terms of the boats we were sailing, the skills I'd need, but also everything about Sail GP from the outset had been set up around purpose and sustainability and impact, and so um, yeah, it felt like the the perfect job rolled into one that's brilliant to hear isn't it and I guess that getting that call on the couple of days before you went for Olympic gold but at least then you know going into it you kind of knew that um you had an outcome at the end of it that you had something to go to on to yeah that's true <laughs> that is true I can I just couldn't even think about it at that point in time it was just like oh that's for later <laughs> <laughs> and um, so you took that fantastic role and then you fell pregnant. So I what did. was the response like to uh, kind of your new employer, as it were, your new role? Yeah. Uh, how did they respond to, to that news? Unbelievably. Yeah, I was unsure when to have a baby. I knew I wanted a baby at some point, but, you know, as, as a woman, obviously time is of the essence to a degree and, and there's all the sort of uncertainty around if and when and how. So after Tokyo, it just felt like we should just crack on and try. And um, yeah, we felt pregnant really quickly. And so I had to tell the team, which felt, yeah, really nerve wracking, to be honest, because the, no one had had a baby and tell GP as an athlete prior to that. So yeah, I went, I went up to Ben's house actually to deliver the bombshell. And it was amazing, to be honest. It was just okay, tell us what you need, we'll make it happen and the, the spot will be ready for you when when you're ready to come back. And just like the relief I felt in that moment was massive. And it was great, you know, we made this plan where I'd you know, still come to the events early on in the pregnancy and I'd help coach on the water with, with our coach, Rob Wilson, but then I'd also take a lead in a lot of the sustainability stuff off the water and the projects we were doing through that. And Sail GP itself, the league, were just phenomenal in facilitating all of that as well. And um, I became their, their global purpose ambassador. So I did lots of work with them. And it just like it just made me think, God, like if we can do this in elite professional sport, everywhere should be able to do this. Like it's a really challenging environment to to facilitate somebody who's trying to have a baby. And it was done so, so well. And I just thought, God, if people value their female that are trying to have babies and yeah, I'd, I don't know, it just made me think like, if you really respect and value someone, you'll make it work. And, and they did. And yeah, I feel very, very lucky. And actually we've now had two more babies in, in Sail GP oh, wow. um, athletes. So yeah, it's, it's really cool to see kind of people gaining the confidence to, to crack on and, and do all of the things they want to do and make it work. That's so good. So good to hear, isn't it? It's interesting, isn't it? When you look at the UK sport updating its pregnancy guidance on the world athletes in the world class program, it's only in 2021. So yep. when you look back now, if things had been different, do you think you might have contemplated taking a break for a family in those Olympic cycles or would that have been unlikely? Possibly. Yeah. It just never felt like whilst I was Olympic campaign, it never really felt like an option to me. It's really hard to stay. To be honest with you, I think, mm. yeah, it's really, really hard to say, but I think it's it's exactly the right step and, you know, obviously came maybe too long, but it's there and I think, yeah, it's 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 really so important. It really is. Like an Olympic cycle is usually four years. Obviously, this one's been a bit weird and been three years, but usually four years. And so for me, you know, there is there's definitely time for, for female athletes to to have a baby and start a family and, and come back to the sport they love and deliver performances. And we've seen it 
um, from from many athletes, whether it's Olympics or outside the Olympics. So, yeah, the precedent set, which is great. I've been really lucky recently to talk to quite a few female athletes who are sharing stories of, of motherhood and elite sport. And we're filming with um, Abby Ward down at Bristol at the moment, who's hopefully coming back soon to play professional rugby, having had a baby this summer. And it's been really interesting. Some of the pieces around that feeling of pregnancy and how you identify as an athlete through that process and then coming back as an athlete as a, you know, with a, having had a baby too. So how did you uh, cope with all of that, the physical and the mental side? too yeah it's it's really hard to be honest and I think for any for any woman having a baby it's very hard because you do lose your identity whether you're an athlete or whatever you know career choice you might have or or life choice you might have you you for those months you can't necessarily do all the things you could do before and you can't be the same person you you're, you're growing a tiny human inside of you and that takes a lot and yeah definitely for me I found um I found it pretty challenging mentally during the pregnancy and and actually afterwards I was really lucky that I just um it kind of felt like once the other had been born I kind of felt like wow okay now's my journey to obviously being a mum but also finding my way back to being an athlete and that was yeah, that was my journey. I know other people have different different experiences, but yeah, it was there is a big identity piece for sure that's um that can be really, really difficult to navigate. For me, that's where I feel incredibly lucky with, with Sail GP and the British Sail GP team and the support I had around still being involved and still feeling like I was a part of the team um for most of my pregnancy. And how soon after the birth of Sienna were you back on the water? My first day on the water was the 1st of January, which was like two and a half months after Sienna was born. And that was just locally in Pool Harbour, just on the water, cruising around on something called a wing foil, which is kind of a vaguely new sport, but it's a lot of fun. So if you've not checked it out, check it out. It's great. Is that like the windsurfing foil? It's it's a little foil on kind of like almost a surfboard. You hold this tiny little wing, yeah. blow up. Yeah, it's unbelievable. It's very cool. I've seen that over Bray Lake. I walk by past Bray yeah. Lake, and I always think oh, it looks like they're flying. It's like the most, yeah. it's like the most amazing sport. It is. It's unbelievable. And so I was really keen to do that before I went and sailed again with Sail GP because you know there's a lot of core work and stability, and just that gave me the confidence. Then I was going to Singapore a few weeks later for the first Sail GP event back. But I was obviously incredibly nervous because you can't, there's no there's no practice on Sail GP. You can't just go for a sail in these boats called the F50. Like they're, they're just unbelievable machines. So yeah, I was really nervous. But again, the team um Sail GP just facilitated everything. Like they brought, we brought a second female athlete out, Hannah Diamond, who was there to help me. And, but also like if I needed a break during the training, she could jump on board and, and and do my role then and, and the same like if if I didn't feel ready to race Ham was going to step in and, and do it and so there was lots of things like that put in place that just gave me the confidence to go and bring Sienna bring Nick my my fiance and and just see just see if it could work and it did it was amazing and so yeah that was that was it then back back in full swing after that I saw a really beautiful video that you shared about you're talking about the freedom you feel out on that water, you know, to be back as yourself almost, and then coming back to lands and back into that mother role with Sienna too. So how, do you feel you're getting that balance right? Does it feel like a thing to celebrate? It, it looks like it is from the outside in. Yeah, it really was. You know, I was so nervous about leaving her for the five hours or whatever that I was going to be on the water. You know, she was three months old and I was still breastfeeding and, um, yeah, I was really nervous, but do you know what? You just like I got, I went on the water, and it's weird to say, but you forget, you know, you forget you're a mum in that moment. You're just doing your job as an athlete. And it was so freeing and just made me feel so, I don't know, it just gave me so much energy. And then to come in and know that she was going to be there waiting for me, and um, yeah, it was honestly just the most amazing, amazing feeling. Feeding her in and around that was just. An absolute logistical challenge, but um, yeah, again, we we did all the things we needed to to make that possible, and um, 
yeah, it was such a, I'll never forget that trip to, to Singapore, that first trip away. I spoke to um, Caroline Wozniacki for the podcast recently, and she talked about the support that's needed to travel on a global tennis circuit with very young children too, and and her husband and the role that he's taken too, and you've mentioned Nick there as well. So how has it been sort of juggling that as a family to be able to keep competing with CellGP? I'm not going to, definitely not going to try and sugarcoat it. It's, it's a lot of um, planning, but we were really fortunate that Nick, decided to step back from his job. Um, you know, he had almost his dream job probably coaching the the British Olympic windsurf team. And we got to January twenty twenty three this year. And, you know, we were going to Singapore and and things just starting to ramp up for me. And it just we put the calendar together and it was just like this is not the life that we want. You know, we want to be able to do things as a family, especially in these early years. So um yeah, he's he stepped back. And um, which allowed me to to continue doing what I wanted to do, which, yeah, it, it's just a way of the way we decided we wanted to do it. And um, it's it's made it all possible because for me, leaving Siena, is, I find very, very difficult. Um, I do obviously go away and, and at times they don't come, but a lot of the time they do. And for me, that, that definitely makes it possible to do what I'm doing. It is interesting as well that, that's that piece about partnership, isn't it? I spoke to Lizzie Dagden too about and her husband coming on tour. But I, I think it's being honest and open about the, the fact that raising a family is, a, you know, it's a partnership together, isn't it? It's, you can't just kind of go off and, and do it on your own and both have your, in some cases, both have your own careers. It is something yeah, uh, about coordinating that together. A hundred percent. And that's that, for me, that's where the communication comes in and, you know, just being really honest about everything and putting everything down and um and then making a plan together so that everyone kind of feels like there's a bit of give and take or you know whatever works for you i spoke to the wonderful free morgan on the podcast who's director of purpose for cell gp and she really enlightened me a lot about cell gp so i suggest listeners go back and find her episode series 11 i think it was but she also talked about really openly about the challenges of getting more women into a sport, which you kind of alluded to at the beginning there in terms of that female athlete pathway. Um, it, it just feels like almost when I look at Olympic sport, it feels like it is fairly gender equal, the Olympic pathway and so on. But that isn't the same for other forms. It, it does feel like it's very, it's been very male dominated. So is, is that changing? You're obviously part of that change. Is it? Do you feel um, kind of positive about how that is changing? Yes, I mean it is changing a hundred percent. The women's pathway program with Cell GP is obviously a big part of that, and there's lots of different sort of initiatives coming in throughout our sport to to try and facilitate female athletes um, within sailing. But it's you know it's it's slow. It never feels quite like enough's being done. I think sailing is such a unique sport, and particularly with Sail GP and, and the types of boats we're sailing now, these really high performance foiling fast boats you might think need, you know, the top athletic physical people to be sailing them. And, and you do need a certain ele- element of athleticism. But actually, a lot of the roles on the boat, you don't at all. You know, driver, the, the wing trimmer who, who's trimming the, the big sail and the flight controller who's literally flying the boat, like a lot of those roles aren't physical particularly. And so any male or female athlete could do those roles. So we are where we are in terms of experience and opportunity for for the guys. And these types of boats came in 10, 12 years ago with the America's Cup, which was dominated by by the male sailors at that point in time. So their, their jump in experience is massive. You know, it's 10, 12 years to try and catch up. So the challenge is pretty big, but with things like the Women's Pathway Programme and and other things that are going on in the sport, there is slowly these opportunities coming. And I feel like we're at a tipping point within the sport where if we can really start to push the the envelope with with the roles and responsibilities we're giving the female athletes, like the next generation, it doesn't matter who you are, are you right for, for the role? And I think it'll be a very different story, which is really exciting to kind of be a part of that challenging the envelope and pushing the envelope 
I really like it. I spoke to Tracy Edwards on the podcast too. Wow, I, amazing. Yeah, she's extraordinary, isn't she? And I think that she was so open about that inherent sexism that she'd seen and experienced. And, and so, you know, it's fantastic that things are changing. Do you think that the performance on the boat feels different when you've got a, a balance of gender there? Does it make a difference to the performance too? Oh, I, I'm such a believer that having, you know, men and women in a team, whatever that team, is such a positive it just creates a completely different environment. And even in our team, I look at like when it's just me as the only female athlete, which which we don't have anymore, but uh, you know, to start with, that was sometimes the case. And five or six guy athletes all sat around the table with the coach, who's also a guy. Like the, the dynamic was very different to when we have two female athletes and, and that make up. Like it's such a different scenario and actually everyone – is a bit more relaxed, a bit more open, a bit less ego possibly on the table sometimes to have the conversations to help the performance of the team. I Like I really have noticed that. And so for me, it's only a positive. And it's been really interesting to kind of see that shift between one female, two females, and just trying to get that balance, I guess, within the team and how that changes, changes the dynamic. It's really, really interesting. That's fascinating, isn't it? I'd like to close, if I can, just talk a little bit more about your work on sustainability. And, and you've talked a lot about that, having that profile and then utilising that profile to drive change. And clearly that's continued on with all the work that CellGP do around uh, the Impact League and so on. So is, is that something you're still very much involved with now? Obviously, you've got quite a lot on your plate, haven't you, at the yeah. moment, Hannah? But, but in terms of competing and you know and and motherhood, you know, being a part of the family too, as well as uh, that element of, of driving change. Yeah, it is. I mean, it, you know, like you said, there's there's a lot going on. I'm lucky that with Sail GP, it's kind of inbuilt, and so you mentioned the impact league. Like, definitely go and listen to Fee's podcast um, because she'll talk all about it. And the impact league is so innovative, and it's where all sport and probably all business needs to start going. Is around the impact and maybe making a competition out of it. But yeah, for me, it's more critical than ever, especially I think having Sienna and, and just seeing visually the next generation coming through in my in my own life. I just think, my God, there's so much we need to, to try and do, particularly when it comes to the climate crisis. And I work, um, I co-founded an organisation, Athletes of the World, after Tokyo with a fellow athlete, Melissa Wilson, um, which is all around athletes using their voice and educating athletes to understand the climate crisis and, and to feel confident in talking about it publicly or with their sponsors or whatever it is to try and push for change within their sport or, or within their fan base or within their, their sponsors, you know, whoever their kind of sphere of influence is. It's all about trying to, trying to capitalize on the power of the athlete and the power of sport to make change when it comes to the climate crisis. So yeah, that's been, um, that's been an amazing project to be a part of and um yeah i guess you know i'm i'm i find i get so much motivation out of doing things outside of just my sailing i guess to to try and make a difference in my own small way um and i think that's all all any of us can try and do really it was so great to talk to hannah do go back and find previous episodes where I was in conversation with Fee Morgan and Tracy Edwards. If you enjoyed this podcast, there are over 160 episodes featuring conversations with women's sport trailblazers and they're all free to listen to on podcast platforms or you can find them at fearlesswomen.co.uk. My previous guests include elite athletes, broadcasters, coaches, administrators, scientists, officials and CEOs from a vast range of sports. The whole of my book, Game On, The Unstoppable Rise of Women's Sport, is also free to listen to on the podcast. Every episode of Series 13 is me reading a chapter of my book. Thanks again to Sport England for backing the game changes through the National Lottery and also a big thank you to Sam Walker at What Goes On Media who does such a great job as our executive producer. Thank you also to my brilliant colleague at Fearless Women, Kate Hannan. Do 
do follow us to make sure you don't miss out on future episodes and if you have a moment to leave a rating or a review it would be great as it really does help us to reach new audiences come and say hello on social media where you'll find me on linkedin twitter and instagram at sue anstis the game changes fearless women in sport <laughs>